This conversation is with Julia Bonafidi. She co-founded Rosetta Analytics over six years ago. We'll get into what they do today, but just to summarize it, they're an active management company using proprietary deep reinforcement learning models to solve and build investment strategies for quantitative investors. Prior to this, Julia was president of Wilshire Consulting. In this discussion, we'll focus on the ins and outs of quantitative trading. Just a reminder here that nothing said is legal, tax, or investment advice. Check out the disclaimer below. We hope you enjoy this interview. Please like and subscribe if you find this information helpful and check out the links in the description to connect with us and Julia. Awesome. So I guess just to get started, do um, you mind just telling us a little bit about what you guys do at Rosetta Stone? Sure. Well, it's Rosetta Analytics and uh, we're, <laughs> Rosetta Stone, I could maybe speak three languages if you want to translate it. <laughs> it's somewhat of the same concept is you know, we're, we're um, extracting information from data, um, but we're an asset management firm. So we manage money on behalf of uh, institutional clients. And we do that uh, with uh, artificial intelligence powered investment strategies. And so what that means is we use um, advanced artificial intelligence, neural networks, so deep learning, deep reinforcement learning to manage our four live strategies. So I'd love to talk about, you know, what you guys, you know, how, how did you start with the traditional assets and your transition to alternatives? Um, well, we, we started off, uh, this is back in 2016, uh, looking for a path to uh, finding sustainable alpha. It's the holy grail in asset management. If you can find an idiosyncratic return um, that obviously you can combine in a total portfolio. We did that uh, with the premise that um, traditional quant models that use linear frameworks or linear regression um, really don't capture all of the information in the data that they're extracting. And typically this is from time series data. So we went towards deep learning uh, because using a neural network is inherently nonlinear in terms of the information it extracts. It also has properties um, within the framework of the algorithms that allow you to um, store these patterns that are extracted um, so that the, the model can refer back and generalize those patterns through time. And uh, having that capability where you have a, a self-adapting framework, you're not um, constantly um, looking for new information to inform, uh, the model does that itself from the data. And so it was a very elegant way to think about um, how do we create a predictive engine. And we are working with um, our seed investor and partner, Verger Capital Management, that manages the Wake Forest University Endowment. Um, that whole team came out of um, Wake Forest. And um, they also were looking for a pioneering technology that could potentially disrupt asset management. And we spent some time analyzing their portfolio. Um, I've spent uh, almost 25 years at Wilshire in various capacities, but the last is president of Wilshire Consulting. And we advised um, the world's largest um, allocators and uh, spent a lot of time in their portfolios and uh, looking for a unique return stream, as I said, is, is something that all investors are, um, are seeking. And so in, in, in Berger's case, in the Wake Forest case, um, they needed some assistance with uh, modifying their US equity exposure. And so we thought, well, let's look at a very deep liquid market like the S&P, give the largest 500 companies um, high quality stocks. And uh, since we're a commodity trading advisor, we. Uh, would implement that using uh, futures, the E-mini futures contract. And after going through um, the training process of building um, our first models, uh, we discovered that there was in fact um, strong information in the signal that could be traded. And uh, 
our first two strategies, DL1 and DL2, were launched in September 1st, 2017, and Verger um, uh, agreed to seed those two strategies, and we were off to the races and uh, began our track record. And so we've had a, a great opportunity to observe uh, how neural networks um, glean information and how they navigate different regimes. There's been quite a lot of uh, rich experience within that time frame, as you can imagine. <laughs> it's been um, everything from uh, COVID to um, the end of quantitative easing to uh, all sorts of changes in um, uh, how the capital markets operates. And so it's, it's uh, we, we've seen the models perform um, in a very interesting way and in it and in um, uh, in specifically in our DO models an uncorrelated way we moved from a research uh, framework of just looking at a directional signal to uh, sizing the trader allocating to the market so that's what made us uh, move from deep learning to deep reinforcement learning with our second set of models, which are based on deep reinforcement learning. And that's um, a very interesting decision framework, um, creating an optimal decision based on this learning ability away again, but it's a reinforcement loop that um, is um, constantly evaluating um, its decision through a reward and penalty framework. So the, the actor critic component of it is a perfect um, uh, ballast to, uh, to not only making the decision, but evaluating whether it worked or not. Very That's interesting. And in I guess in terms of like deep learning versus deep reinforcement learning, could you could you dive a little bit into that and you know kind of the differences? Sure. Um, so, uh, it, at, at their essential elements, deep learning is minimizing a loss function. Okay, so if you think about all of the different data points that the model is traveling through time um, at any given moment. Um, to get to the prediction, which ours is predicting the next day direction of the S&P, um, you need all of that data to fully describe that outcome. But that's a crystal ball. So if you had perfect information at just the right time to make a decision, and you could get it right 100% of the time, right? Well, in the real world, in real models, there's always slippage, right? There's always uh, some distance um, between those dots that you're trying to describe if you graphed them. And you've seen the graphs where all of the data is clustered in a certain way or a certain pattern. And linear models can capture data where your x-axis and your y-axis converge in a straight line, right? So your prediction uh, is, and all those dots are, are very close to that line. When the data is more dispersed, that's noise, that's information that can't be described. Um, so that's your error term. And so a deep learning model is trying to eliminate that. And it does that by being able to look at curves and planes through data. So you can actually get closer to um, hidden relationships than you can with linear models. And so it's constantly striving, iterating through the data, recombining information to get as close to that prediction as it possibly can. Now, a deep reinforcement learning model um, also has a neural network, so it's extracting all of that same, possibly same information if you're using the same data sets. Um, but now there's an optimization framework that works um, in concert with the feature extraction to create um, a very broad distribution of outcomes that is not just a point in time, but it's able to look back at a previous decision and see where the success or failure of that was and now recalibrate itself 
to new information and um, trying to eliminate that error in terms of did I extract the right information? Did I combine it in the right way? And I'm using myself as I, but it's really the model that's recalibrating. So if you think about all of the different, um, think about assembling a puzzle and, and it has, um, the, the, the pieces can morph, right? So the picture might be the same, but you could change the shape of those puzzle pieces in ways that would make it change how, the picture could be described, it would be the same picture. Um, so any of those vast combinations of changing data and then any of the ways that you could recombine that into an optimal um, decision, that's deep reinforcement learning, right? So think about robotics, um, where you're trying to train um, a robot to complete a task and do it in a way that it doesn't um, either assemble something or detonate something if it's doing something dangerous. Um, and it, when it does that incorrectly, it blows up. That's a penalty, right? <laughs> um, when it does it right, that's a reward. So, um, so as you reinforce that with a decision loop and say, okay, you, in this in simulation, you got all of these decisions right. So. Um, we're going to reward you mathematically for that. Um, and then all of the decisions you got wrong, you're going to learn from that so you don't do it again. That's essentially what deep reinforcement learning is doing. So um, you train the models over time, over the data sets, and then you um, there's an out of sample framework to see if those uh, that those decisions actually work in a, a real life situation without uh, the training wheels on and that's the out of sample piece of it and then if everything generalizes and um, you're certain that uh, you've uh, constructed a sound model then you would release it into the wild and see how it does and that's essentially um, how you build any model but these that's functionally how these work no, that's pretty fascinating i just that whole process that you described i'm just curious uh juliet is there a situation, I mean, we described some of the challenges you guys have experienced or maybe you know, over-training or over-optimizing the model, what happens and how you've had to kind of recalibrate certain things over time. I'd be interested in that as well. Sure, well, um, uh, it, that that's the, the, I guess, the separation between um, having experience and skilled um, uh, developers, engineers, scientists, to construct these models because there's um, very defined ways to do this the right way so that you don't introduce biases, you don't overfit. I mean, obviously you can make mistakes in any field, but, and you know, there's uh, um, horseshoes and hand grenades, right? So, you know, you <laughs> it's only the two place where close actually. <laughs> not a good thing right so um, you you um, you need to to construct your models everything from whiteboarding of the idea of is is this a good idea uh, to look at this data set or this market trade you know we're asset managers so we're actually managing um, other people's money which is a fiduciary relationship and um, by all account, all uh, standards should be held to the highest standard. And so building, uh, especially a systematic model, um, you wanna make sure that you have uh, conceptualized the idea that, okay, does this make sense to trade here? Um, do we have the data? Is the data clean? You know, the very basics of model building. And then how do you construct those data sets in a way that um, can be ingested in the model? That's the curation part of the data. And then setting up the model framework itself to make sure that uh, you haven't created unintentional biases or um, there are examples out there now that everyone is really paying attention to how uh, these models are built. You've probably read about you know, some of the missteps in building these large language models and um you know the idea that you there's twofold one where 
you run your model to the extent that you get the desired outcome that you wish for. <laughs> okay, that, that can create um, a certain amount of, um, I guess, excitement over success, but then when you need to go and repeat it, that doesn't necessarily work out for you. So um, that's, a, that's a very intentional bias. Two, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of discussion out there about training AI models on AI output, right? So you now are building a bias in there that, you know, potentially is an artificial output and that you're training a model. But then there's also other famous examples of um, training models um, that, you know, could have cultural biases in them, or um, maybe you just have bad data that you, you know, you missed a spot and you need to go back and, and correct that. And, um, you know, ethical behavior and having a discipline is very important in any profession, and it's no different in AI. And so um, from our standpoint, we've always started from first principles in terms of making sure that we have um, uh, integrity and then a feedback loop and then we always get outside um, opinions for anything that we produce both from a, cl a client perspective but we have outside advisors that we ask for to pick apart our our results um, see if there's anything that's that uh, uh, comes to mind and, and we've always been fortunate to have um, great advisors that that help us uh, look at that. That said, we've you know in the in the research process we've looked at models that are too good to be true, and you sit back and say, oh, "Wouldn't that be great?" Um, but you know you don't go live with those models when you have you know an eight hundred percent return. Like, okay, is that possible? There there has to be a um, a framework of of common sense and logic in terms of you know does this make sense because um you know you, you don't want to you don't even especially with an autonomous model like we build you don't want to have something that um can run every day that has you know something that performed so well in the back test and you don't see it happening you know in your in your live or out of sample results Absolutely. I'm curious too, just from, from your perspective, obviously, as you've gone through this journey of uh, music, utilizing these large language models, um, what, is the, what are the current trends? We don't use them, by the way. We don't use large language models. Those are examples. We use yeah, deep reinforcement own. learning uh, yeah. from, uh, from time series. So we're not using unstructured data yet um, with yeah. uh, language. So, but that said, it's probably applies anyway. Makes sense. No, that, that's that's excellent. Yeah. So I guess from your perspective, as as you guys have gone down this this road of, um, kind of like reiterating the process in your own um, uh, business here, at, at what's what does risk management look like from from your perspective? How has that changed um, as you kind of go through your process on a daily, monthly basis as an asset manager, as a CTA? Um, well, there's there's many different types of risk, right? When, I mean, we're, we're still in startup phase, even though we've been um, uh, doing this since 2016. And what that means, and, and you know, to the extent uh, in, in most businesses, uh, you, um, you work with with the resources that you have and we've been very fortunate to have um, very talented um, teammates that um, are very disciplined in terms of how models are developed but in an asset management framework what what we have ended up doing is being very focused on automation um, because the more that you automate the um, the routine tasks, um, the less likely you're going to fat finger something or that you're going to have, you know, a, a data input that doesn't come in, um, you know, with the, um, the, I guess, the quality assess, uh, assurance testing procedures that you have. So we started off building our models. It's one thing to build a model. It's another thing to um, put it into production. And so we've spent a lot of times 
time on our platform. So we have an institutional quality platform. Uh, and what we mean by that is we, we can um, do rapid experimentation through the, the pipes that we've created through our data straight to our models. And sorry about that. Um, straight to our models to um, at the execution part. And then we spent uh, a bit of time and resources on the trading platform. And um, this is all probably boring stuff in the background, but it really is important in terms of um, not just building the automation through, but building the um, the alert system that we have um, that tells us, okay, did each of the pieces of automation work properly? And and that's where we we when you spend a lot of time. Uh, on the forefront, understanding where things break because you see them break, <laughs> but then there's times when they break and you don't see them break. <laughs> and so, um, those are those are the catastrophic failures. And um, you can't uh, you can't plan for all of them. But if you stop and every time something happens, you you reassess and you automate, then pretty soon you get on the other end of that. You're like, wow, this is pretty cool. We can just watch. And so. <laughs> Um, that, that's where we are now from from uh, all of this experience through time. Of, I mean, the world has has hacks, right? I mean, everybody's seen, okay, AWS went down or this went down and those kind of things. You sit there and, oh my gosh, what are you going to do about, um, about AWS going down where there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do when AWS goes down? And luckily, it doesn't happen very often. But you can actually build redundancies to the process so that you can keep going or build procedures around what what happens if this scenario happens, what am I going to do? And so, um, uh, you know, that, that that's something that we have a lot of experience on and you just make sure that you build your business as resilient as possible so that you can mitigate those risks. Now, investment risks, that's a different story. That's something that you buy into every time you put a dollar into a market. So, um, and, and that that's a whole other conversation we could go down <laughs> in terms of those, those types of risks. Sure. No, no, it's very interesting though, just kind of hear your thoughts and insight as you've gone down this uh, other Word rabbit hole uh, through your career and, and kind of what you built here. I'm just curious from, uh, um, you mentioned automation, which I think everybody's trying to make sure that, you know, make the best use and efficient use of their mm -hmm. their time, their business, uh, building structures and automation tools and, and uh, workflows. Has that really progressed, not just from an investment management standpoint, from a, but from a business operations standpoint, have you guys thought about different things to uh, automate internally uh, to make better use of your time as you kind of build out uh, uh, different things in your in your own business, I'm just curious as as things have progressed there. Yeah, there, there's certain functions that you can automate and certain that you can't. Right? I think right. it's it's funny because you know we're awash in um, conversations right now about AI replacing people. Right? Right. Right. And 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 so I was just sitting here imagining the two of you as a bot right and so right, ai right. is feeding in your questions and in you know how, is is it going to capture you know what your next thought process is you know and what would i be ready for it and um that's not there right so so when you think about the essential functions of a business. There's the main operations about your product. There's the HR side, which is a, essentially a human side. There's, you know, automated parts of that. Like, okay, can we automate payroll? Can we automate, you know, mm -hmm. you know, all, all of, you know, our, 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 um, you know, our monthly accounting cycle, you know, all of the, the billings, you know, the, basic functions of business to some extent you can but you still have human interactions the world isn't that automated yet now the business development process that's probably you know the one that needs to be leveraged the most but that'll never be and i mean and rightfully so right can you imagine right. just um uh here's my here's my deck uh read my deck give me money that would be a really great Wish it was that easy, right? Really, right, exactly. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, and we don't want to lose that element of it. But I think, you know, you're 
you're exactly right. You know, how do you scale people? And that's, that's, I think, where, you know, when you can automate, you know, the, the routine tasks and, um, that's, that's where I think we've taken our business and we have, I think probably one of the most efficient, uh, investment management firms out there from that perspective. Um, so there, there is, um, time for creative thought and, you know, how, um, you know, how you, how you advance in a world that where information is changing and technology is changing so rapidly so that you can, you know, make the right decisions at the right time and um, create longevity in, in your, in your business. Absolutely. Yeah. I've always thought just, you know, as, as all, well, there's a lot of noise and talk about AI lately, it's not going to, it's not going to replace you and I, it's, it's just going to enhance what we already do as, as a, as a human, right? Yeah, you know it. It is, but but it'll be taken too far, right? Right. Uh, and and it, and and it already it already is. Uh, you know, there's, you know, the 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 concept, the ethics frameworks that are being developed right now are. There's so much that's squishy out there, just from ethics in general. Um, I, I, you know, no one wants to have any black and white rules anymore. And so if you are going to uh, try to program ethical rules into AI or rely humans to do that when, you know, nobody can either uh, can agree what's right and wrong anymore, yeah. what, what is that, what, where does that leave us? And so, you know, we don't have to get existential here, but um, the that's where I think that this is all heading because um, you, uh, I, I, I don't see how humans um, are going to process all of this information without the help of AI that's being thrown at you. But what information do you want to receive, right? Do you do you really want that being decided for you? And that's that's where that's unfortunately where we are right now. And I think that's where all the fuss is. Absolutely. And uh, I guess kind of getting back to the nuts and bolts of it, you know, when it when it comes to like building these uh, algorithms, building these training strategies, is it are you kind of just feeding it, uh, you know, feeding the AI? this, you know, inputs, and then it just becomes kind of a black box with outputs? Or how do you kind of look at that, uh, you know, the aspect between inputs and, and outputs on the other end? That's a great question. Um, so inputs, we use market data. That's where we felt most comfortable because, you know, we, we wanted to have, um, we didn't want to spend all of our time on data. And we thought there was information in market data. So we were looking for um, markets that we thought would be um, where AI would be successful. And they, and, and it's turned out that there's um, a broad range of successful markets out there because I think of, of a lot of dynamics going on there. So um, I would say, yes, it's a black box in terms of being able to say, okay, the, 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 algorithm made this decision or gave this signal because of XYZ happening in the markets. Um, but it, from a, a black box perspective, um, many investment models are, you, you wouldn't talk to the investment manager and they would say, um, okay, right this very second as I'm running this model and placing this, this um, trade, I know exactly why you know it's doing that. I would have to go back ex post and analyze the data, and we do that. So um, it's it's more, um, uh, I guess, a comfort of who's of, of do you have uh, integrity in the process in terms of yeah. the black box? You know, so I mean, you, there's you could, a lot you could of kind of like poke yeah. poke around and see like its decision making process. Well, you you. 
after ex post. So when I when if I showed you analytics on the strategies um, to traditional investment analytics um, from everything from, you know, returns to risk to other statistical ratios or the trades, you you could see all of that. Um, but I wouldn't tell you. I, I could tell you, I could see a series of trades and I could see what's going on in the markets. And I, you know, can look at those analytics and say, well, that there's maybe some causality there, um, but I, I can't pinpoint it. And so there's a lot of um, interpretability frameworks that are being um, developed out there. And I'm not so sure it's that important from what we're doing that we have that interpretability um, because of what what we're doing with the decision. I mean, you could see where if you're um, doing medical diagnostics and you um, want to make sure that you understand which pieces of data led you to diagnosing um, whatever you'd want to know what those are, right? Um, in this case, um, if you have, if you're just using pricing information in different return series, the information that's coming out of that is, is it, you know, there are, there are relationships through time, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, how the market is trading and the behavior of those markets. So, kind of a uh, it's a different issue in my in my view um it, yeah. it's it's more if you went to, i mean think think about um any any quantitative investor who is saying that that you know i'm trading momentum well if you get that wrong you still have a momentum model that you built but maybe your model didn't catch the momentum and so it, that's just the breaks of, of, you know, doing what we're doing in active management. It's not an index fund. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I like the comparison to the the medical field. It, you know, puts it in perspective. It's more, you know, kind of, I would say black and white, but it's a little bit more black and white when it comes, comes to trading. Yeah. Um, is, is there ever, uh, you know, is there ever a time that you want to like turn the strategy off? Like whether it's, you know, like alpha decay over time or like, <laughs> it might be doing something crazy that you're not expecting. Uh, you know, is there ever times that you, you you would go and turn it off manually? We don't, but yes, there are many times we would want to. As you watch, I, I mean, there sometimes there. I, I can give you an example in um, in in February of 2020. <laughs> Just put yourself back in February of 2020, um, and. Um, Around the middle of the month, I think around February 19th, the, the S&P just jumped off a cliff. And we 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 went right with it. <laughs> and so we sat there going, oh, this is hard. This is terrible. This is terrible. You know, this is part of investing, right? Because, you know, as as um, Howard Marks or Warren, Warren Buffett, I'm not sure which one said, you know, did you see who's wearing a bathing suit when the tide goes out, right? And so, um, so we we watched uh, for two weeks, and you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket during this time frame, uh, as you know, the virus is coming. You know, the 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 Saudis are wiping out the oil market. The and then starting in March, the treasury markets freeze. So it's starting to feel a lot like October, September, October of 2008. And uh, so every, everybody, you know, at that point, correlations go to one, right? You just like, oh my gosh, let's, where's my, where's my dollar bill? <laughs> and so um, it, it, then all of a sudden um, in the middle of um, all of that melee, um, you know where we were persistently uh, long, the model just started trading every day, and that was just extreme volatility. If you go back to that point, and we and and you're in the you're in the zone during that, and all of this is going on, and then at the end of the month, we looked up, and you know we were up an extraordinary amount, and saw that 
Okay, that's really interesting that that just clicked in that quickly. Um, and now we have observed that several times in the return patterns and um, the, the, the empirical evidence of being able to detect regime change is there. And um, that's really gratifying to see that, you know, okay, there, there can, there, there are time periods where there's a very strong signal. And if you think about markets, um, you know, we've just come off, off and on a 14-year bull market. There's been hiccups in between, but a lot of that has been driven by zero interest rate policy. And now zero interest rate, interest rate policy is gone and markets are volatile. That, you know, that there's a lot of uncertainty and our models like uncertainty. And um, that's where um, AI has its strength is, you know, being able to detect patterns. And so, you know, there's going to be a lot of conversation out there continually about not being able to see the same information that an AI can see just because we can't process information as quickly and um, harnessing that is the future. Absolutely. That's great. Um, there's another question I was just thinking about as you kind of, if, if, this is fascinating, by the way, just how you kind of go through this process uh, and uh, explain all this here. Uh, from just from your client's perspective, what is the feedback as you kind of talk about your process, your your model, uh, your expertise, and kind of what what's what's happening with your, your trading strategies? I'm just curious, kind of the, the feedback and what what uh, what questions they have asked uh, that may be uh, you know maybe elementary to you guys, but you know maybe that's this kind of a, a theme they're overriding uh, the same question going on on an ongoing basis that that gets asked by you guys by your team. Uh, how do you know your model's working? Right. Right. You don't you, you you don't get those questions when it's having stellar performance. You get that when it's drawing down and models draw down. I mean, we don't have a crystal ball. We have a we have a great a, a great um, algorithm, but there there will be times where you have drawdown and like in in any what makes this different is because the 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 there's no interpretability. Um, you know, there has to be a, a, a faith and a trust that the model is going to operate the way you would think it would, which is what we saw in back tests and in out of sample in those environments. And we just actually came out of one where we, I mean, we had in 2022, we had um, incredible performance relative to the S&P. And we don't use leverage, by the way. So it was, um, you know, truly the model performing, which is what you want to see. And um, then at the end of the year, there was a, you know, a reasonable size drawdown, but the models came back in a, an incredible way in uh, March and they've been doing very well since. And um, so you, you go through those periods and then like it's, it's behavioral, right? You, it's natural not to want to lose money. And so, I, even if over over time, and that's 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 the time value of money, right? There's volatility in between, but you look on the other end and you've compounded your wealth. But being able to stay the course in between, that's investing. That's the difference between speculation and investing. And so um, the that's you know that that's what our clients ask us, and that's. Um, making sure that that you're disciplined during all parts of it is what gives your client trust that you're not changing things that you're not changing your model I, back to 2020 how many articles did you read in april may 2020 about quantitative managers going back to the table and rethinking their models a lot and so <laughs> And, and I've seen that throughout my career when 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 models stop working and you go back to the table and you rethink your models, what's it there for? If you have, I mean, that's a human framework. And so uh, AI models, specifically neural nets, they are constantly adapting and improving through data. 
and you, you, they they reset themselves. That's exactly. that recombining of patterns. And so that's the strength of AI. And the other strength of it is those features that it's extracting are dynamic and they change as well. And they are recombined um, based on the new environment in which they're um, calculating those relationships. Whereas traditional models, once you have the human precepts that you're looking at. So if you have five factors, six factors, eight factors, whatever it is, that's all you're going to look at. It's all they're capable of looking at. And so you're not narrowly defined from the outset in terms of what relationships you're looking at, because that changes dynamically through time. Any thoughts on the future of trading? In terms of, you know, are humans still going to be competitive in, you know, a decade, two decades? Any thoughts on that? Of course. Um, I mean, think humans are creating all of this, right? I mean, there's there's human fingers on all of this code, and so um, there will be uh, markets will change, you know, liquidity changes. Um, participants change. I, I mean, go back in time and look at the top 10 names of the S&P through the decades, and you'll see uh, industries in and out of favor. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's very rare that you'll see, you know, that now we do have that. You'll see Apple and some of these names in there for over time, but you'll see them drop in and out. And, you know, will we be talking about the same investments will we be talking about carbon offsets 10 years from now what who will will i mean it, it, i don't think that we're going to be this scene out of wally where we're all on this conveyor belt you know doing nothing because you know there's nothing to do there's 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 going to be new frontiers to explore you know it's it's funny because um you know, there's been this fight about passive, uh, about pack, passive versus active management since it was introduced in the in the 70s, when the S&P was first introduced. And um, you're seeing passive overtake active because you know it's delivered. It's hard to beat the market. Truly hard to beat the market. And um, but you still have to have diversification because very few people can stay 100% invested in equity throughout their lifespan. And um, so you see an evolution of asset management. There's been an evolution of financial engineering. And, um, you know, I think as markets correct, it flushes investors out and then a new set come in and new ideas come in and, Probably we'll still have index funds, but uh, and we'll invest in broad markets. But you need active managers to clear those markets, or else you just continually have assets flowing into the into and picking winners. So I mean, there's pros and cons to it, but it does you know markets correct, and they will. And there's going to there, I I, I foresee. Uh, um, a, a fairly healthy correction in our future. So um, that's when active management will will have its day again. Love it, Julia. Where, uh, in terms of uh, you know, any any advice that you have for maybe somebody looking to launch a, a quantitative hedge fund? Well, uh, you know, try. You need an information edge, and um, otherwise, you'd end up having an index fund anyway. And so. The um, elusive alpha is typically associated around timing, um, and there aren't many successful timers out there, if any, um, that uh, have that information edge. And so um, AI is definitely um, a way to capture information more quickly and um, more variable than um, you see traditionally. And so I think that's a great place to start. But if you can find it, your edge in data, in other kinds of technology, that's great. But it's always gonna come down to the investment decision and information. Awesome, yeah, yeah. thank you so much, Julia. Where, where could people go to connect with you and, and learn more about Rosetta Analytics? 
Uh, well, we um, we're on LinkedIn, so you can you can start there. We also um, uh, Angelo Calvello, my partner. He um, he writes an interesting column that you can find in various places. I think he's writing for CoinDesk now and maybe II. Um, so, uh, but definitely um, uh, can reach us on on LinkedIn. Sounds great. We'll put that in the show notes. Thank you so much, Julia. This has been awesome. Thank you. Great conversation. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please make sure to like and subscribe for more content like this and reach out if you're interested in starting a hedge fund, VC fund, or whatever type of fund that you're thinking about. Let us know if there's any topics that you'd like for us to cover. Thanks for watching.